All right, well, this is Aaron Squire coming to you guys again. Episode 59. We're finally at the end of this location because Aaron Squire is moving. We finally got the loan to go through, so Golden Saucer Guy is here with me tonight. If you guys haven't seen him before, he's going to be taking over the show for a little while, so yeah. don't get scared. <laughs> don't get, Don't be afraid. He's here to, you know ease the transition and make sure that you guys are still being taken care of while I am away taking care of moving and hopefully we'll get this whole like children thing this noise thing figured out with a better room in a new house pretty soon yeah so tonight, it's gonna be sweet it is gonna be sweet I know <laughs> I'm excited about it the loan went through everything's been approved it's exciting uh, yeah. Tonight at Deck Moon the Squire, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, handing over the reins, which we just did, uh, the dress, luck versus skill, some of the news with the new frost ring and stuff, and then when that's going to be coming out. Uh, we'll also be talking about the stress test, the Hex Tech Open, which I still need to sign up for, uh, and a, hopefully we'll get around to talking about some team building, and then finally we'll finish things up with a combo deck doctor. Um, I do have a deck, I'm pretty sure, that I, is on my docket, but I have to go and search through some stuff to find it. So, unfortunately, that one kind of fell down. So, really sorry if there was somebody else on my list next um, that I didn't get to that one. But feel free to keep submitting your deck ideas uh, to Deck Mill the Squire. Also, I would like to say uh, thank you for everyone that voted. The voting is now closed, and it looks like I will be running Kind Mimes deck tomorrow, but not exactly Kind Mimes deck. I've gone, I've gone ahead and made a couple of tweaks, which I think are still in the spirit of the deck. Um, you know, a couple of card changes, but it's pretty much the same deck that uh, that they were running last week. A lot of different people. So um, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be sweet. It's gonna it be awesome. Gonna be sweet. <laughs> All right, so. so let's... <laughs> Oh, I, I, we're stepping on each other. So yeah, that's let's fine. let's start off with the dress. So I'm right. colorblind. I don't know if you guys knew this about me, but I'm colorblind. When I was a kid, um, I had a tr a lot of trouble seeing the difference between blue and purple. Okay. The dress to me in the center, um, uh, for, at first it looked gold and white, and then um, then I realized that it was actually a blue and uh, goldish tint there. Um, so what what did it look like to you, Golden Saucer guy? When you first uh, well, saw it, it looked it looked black, blue and black to me. But blue and black. As I went online, I I am in a household and I went to college with a lot of people who went to art school, and when all this stuff came up, they just kind of sarcastically went, "Ugh, this is so bad." And <laughs> it it was so it was neat. I mean, you figure we the the same day that net neutrality basically gets passed, the bigger pieces of news is the color of a dress and two llamas escaping, and <laughs> I, it could have been more fitting, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I did see that that got brought up on Reddit. So, um, yeah, I'm sure that you guys know all about it, you social media people. I just had to bring it up. There's what I thought about it. Um, I saw blue and gold, or I saw white and gold on it. Well, um, I think the real problem is that that blue is a little bit too much like another blue I've seen, and Magic's probably going to sue them. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we don't talk about that here. <laughs> <laughs> um Let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, luck versus skill. Um, so recently, this past week, I had to do some testing with the deck, of course, and I go into the Proving Grounds. I don't have a team, which we're going to talk about a little later. Um, so I got in there, and I had uh, some a little bit of negative play experiences with some of the newer players. And I understand, you get in there, and I play some really expensive cards, and then I basically look like somebody that just owned you because I had more expensive cards. I also got accused of having more luck than skill. Um, and so, you know what I said to defuse the situation? I suggest you do the same. If if people are saying, oh, you're just getting lucky, then be like, yep, I only win on luck. That should be everybody's response to that, I think. Um, <laughs> I would, you know, uh, we hear Penna Chills a lot. He'll, he'll say it's better to be lucky than to be uh, good sometimes. Um and and I guess there's a little bit of you know there's there's definitely some truth to that, but um, right yeah. right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. any, any views on that or any anything you've noticed recently in the queues? 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of people with like some starter decks or some lower stuff, and I, I do sometimes feel bad if I pull in something where I know it's a, some deck that I've invested some some time into. Right. And that's that's fine. I mean, you as long as you're I, on my end, and as long as I'm being you know gracious and everything like that, it's fine. Like I can't control what other people do. It's, people are gonna arrange a little bit, and that's fine. And as far as the luck goes, I mean, yeah, luck. I did decently well last week. I was. Uh, at one point, I was five and zero going in the last three rounds. So it ended up taking three losses you near know, the end, five three for two weeks in a row. But uh, I had some luck too. I mean, luck is a part of it. If you yeah, have a deck sure. that's well crafted and is good, you mean you're you're basically setting yourself. Well, I am going to achieve this level of play, and then the rest of that from that on is luck and skill. Yeah. So I mean, luck's got to be on your side. I had a game where I top decked both of my uh, menacing Grawks when exactly I needed them. That kind of stuff happens. It's that's, that's what the best part of a random happens. deck is. Yeah, yeah, that's, we had that's some part great of the games. Game. Like they specifically built in the tension of the game that way. Hey, right. what's going on, Lazarus? Uh, yeah, so... I had some good games with. Uh, was it Hexed Havoc? Him and I had went back and forth. I lost in that round. He moved on. It was still. It's a lot of fun. So it happens. Right. Um, so. Yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Just keep being good to each other, and um, you know, if someone accuses you of having better cards, I don't know. It really the hundred gold. If that's what they want, I mean, maybe I, I should just start asking them. Hey, do you really want the hundred gold? And then just concede before I win the game, because it really doesn't matter to me. I'm in there to test a deck. Right. You know, I don't really. I'm I'm in there, and, it, and it's not like I have a lot of pride on the line. If I get beat by somebody, I'm like, okay, I'm weak to this. I'm looking for the answers to why I got beat, you know, not necessarily like putting a lot of personal investment. You got to be able to look at things with cold eyes, you know, sometimes. Uh, so the Hex update this week, we got the Frost Ring launch this March, which is, I'm guessing, tentative. There's still about four or five cards that have been banned in the last, what, five tournaments now? Right, um, right. One of them being Fisher Smith, which could change the entire shape, shape the entire... Um, uh, landscape of the game and I, I really hope that we can get these cards unbanned before or get them fixed before the frost ring uh, gets um, put out you know I guess but at the same time I do realize that there are different teams working on stuff so I don't really expect it I expect the frost ring to come out and there'll still be maybe some little glitchy things here and there but then again um, I haven't played it since like the released weekend so it's, it's probably a lot better than what it was yeah, I mean, I, bugs are going to happen. I mean, we're we were how far are this in? We still have bugs popping up here and there. It, and it's just part of the process. I don't think we're they're going to be 100 percent gone, even after launch. You know, I think we're going to see bugs be something that's prevalent. They're going to be hard to work out. This is a complicated game, so it, it'll happen. The frost ring it looks great. I'm I'm pretty excited about that. So you know, we'll, so we'll go ahead fun. and watch the teaser trailer, and I guess we can talk over it a little bit if if there's something that comes up and. Uh... Oh. Welcome to the great Frost Ring Arena. Only a great man could harness the power of the arena. Bring forth your fire. Bring forth your spells. For I possess that power. I am your overlord. Rise up to meet me. I did not picture that guy sounding like that when he was talking in the game. Did you? I didn't. Well, I, I like all this high resolution quality footage they've, they've put together. I mean, the art's fantastic, and I wanna, I wanna find, a, I want them to give out some of these high resolution artwork pieces so I can make some wallpapers here. Um, but it's it's basically what we've already played a lot, except hopefully it'll be mostly fixed or completely fixed. Um, I, I guess I would I would hope that it's all completely fixed. You can see the new deck backs there, which is kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they'll allow us to use the old ones and, or not. Um, you know, we'll have to see about that. I guess one of the interesting things about it being a digital game, unlike other games, like if you come out with a game and in like four years you decide to change the cards, your your technology gets better, the deck backs kind of have to stay the exact same. Um, whereas in a digital game they can actually sweep and do a sweeping change and change all of them and not allow us to use the old old school ones. Right, right. There's a more than one collectible card game out there that has an error on the back of their card art, and that's stuck there forever. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. 
Um, so the only other thing is there's doing a stress test tomorrow, so make sure that you're getting out for that if you're not in the Hextex open. So we'll just kind of look over at that real quick. Hextex Brigadon is tomorrow. I have to sign up for this. 500 plat fee, which is $5 American, or I don't know if that's still 5 euro um, in euro. But that's tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I didn't do all the time changes for everybody. But I only ask one thing of the people that will be playing in this tomorrow. Please, 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 if you're going to play in this, do not also sign up for the other tournament that's going on at the exact same time. That was, I had one player do that to me last weekend, and that was a little bit frustrating, and that's just a matter of etiquette. I mean, you know, you got to be able to devote your full focus to playing the game and not... Um, spend too much time on your turns because unfortunately we're not able to actually use the chess clocks properly um, mm -hmm. something like this would never happen in a physical game because obviously you can't be in two places at once although I did see a thing on ro uh, loading ready running where uh, there was a guy that was playing in two drafts at the same time and it was humorous to watch them do it however I'm sure that's completely illegal as well yeah, uh, I didn't have that issue too much. I think after I got out of the first two rounds, it was still they had all kinds of delays. I was I was at one point seated at like second, going into like round four. Mm -hmm. So the people that I was there were like playing the win, so it wasn't too much of an issue. But I think this week I will actually, as I oh, we'll talk about this later, but I will probably be in the test. I may not jump in to bring it on. We'll see. So the banned cards for tomorrow are Grave Nibbler, Eldron, Imprisoned, Rune Era Burrower, Fisher Smith still, and Plant Garden. So the big one I think is Fisher Smith. Fisher Smith is probably the most important card that needs to get unbanned. Actually, and then Burrower is. Actually, I had a guy that was playing Bunnies against me, and he was playing Burrower. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this seems like a decent card with what he was doing. He was running the the bunnies like we talked about, and uh, what's it called? Parallel evolution. So mm -hmm. interesting, interesting type of uh, deck. Very, very beat down. He was running four wild growths and some some other stuff. Uh, definitely came. It came underneath my um, my uh, eye of creation deck like every single time. I didn't win to him a single time. So and that's okay. I know that I'm weak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was working on. I remember uh, a few months, maybe a month or so back. I, I had similar deck like that built. I didn't have. There's a obviously some cards that we did differently, but that deck has some surprises in it. You never know. So here is Kind Mime's deck from last tournament that actually top aided. You can see he's got the typical uh, build out. There was a couple of people that had pretty much almost the same main deck build out, and their reserves are a bit different. Um, you can see he's got the four Howling Brave. He's got a ton of ramp in this deck. You got the four Howling Brave, the four Brawlers, Scrap Tech Brawlers, which is you can bury it, and then after three turns it comes into play and gives you three resources, and it gives you a 2 2 body with uh, speed, basically. It can attack the turn it comes into play. Apparently, it's not, it, the, the links are broken. It doesn't want to come up, but it's, it's a dwarf. Um, the Master Moss, of course, is the big money card in this deck because it's legendary. You got three Filk Gapes, which is different than uh, Strife, who decided instead of running three Filk Gapes, he ran two, and he ran an additional, uh, what's it called, Eternal Guardian, which is the 4-4 right. flyer that makes it so nothing takes damage except for Eternal Guardian. Um, it can be very difficult to get rid of because it doesn't get murdered because it is an artifact troop. Um, but he decided to go with uh, an additional Squirrel Titan as well, um, instead. That's basically the only difference between the two decks. Another interesting thing is they only run four Shards of Savagery, and after testing the deck, I felt like that was a bit much for me. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't push it in that direction. Um, but, uh, but yeah, definitely take a look at this deck, and then have this in your mind, and we'll go to my deck after we talk about the team-building um, topic of conversation. Right. Um, I feel like I didn't allow you to give give. I didn't. I didn't give you very much time to uh, actually chime in. No, on that's that fine. Stuff. I'm still a little mad. Kind mime uh, put the deck to me in round six. I think it was. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, he really stuck it to me. So I got to see the deck firsthand, in a painful way. So yeah, it's all good. I mean, it's this is a very much a turn five kind of a deck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, I was I was popping out rhinos, and he was swinging in for damage. It was just not 
wasn't didn't work out for me. Wasn't happening for you. Yep. So team building. First thing with team building is focus. You want to make sure that you and everybody on the team is focused on a specific goal, whether that's going to be um, basically winning tournaments or maybe you want to get together to, I don't know, build some other type of decks or some sort of um, maybe two-headed giant or you have a specific format in mind, like maybe um, you're not going to play standard, you're going to play like a more legacy type of a format, something like that, um, or maybe you want to play like Highlander, uh, you know, first things first, make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, when you're building a team. I, do, I actually haven't been a part of too many teams. I've just mostly read a lot of articles on it. Um, I've tried to put together teams, and it is a very difficult thing to find people that are like-minded enough. It's a lot like putting together a band, which I've also tried to do. I've been in quite a few different, um, I'm also a musician, uh, different bands, and it's just one of those things where you show up, and if everybody isn't on the same page, it's just not going to work out, and you're going to probably make yourself a little bit angry if you just keep showing up I find and so sometimes it's better to just say you know this just isn't worth the time because we aren't on the same page doesn't mean that they're what their goals are and what they're doing um, and their focus isn't good or it doesn't work for them it's just you need to make sure that it's you know what your focus is for all of your things so um, anything you want to chime in there no, I haven't done much team play either. I, the thing that's positive about team play in Hex, though, is it gives you an opportunity to face off against people of some similar skill level where you're not necessarily just jumping into, let's say, the tournament queue or just some random person. Right. You know, you, you have some focused play, and your people you're playing with can build decks that can focus on the things you're worried about. So you can yeah, kind of play actually, off that. I actually feel bad, like, whenever I get into a game and I'm playing against someone where I know it's not, like, a Tier 1 or even a Tier 2 deck, um, I feel like I'm wasting their time, um, because, like, it's, like, there's a, you know, they can, they can win, and that's fine, it's not a big deal, but the odds are pretty low, um, and it just, it's a big waste of time for both players involved, right. uh, when you aren't on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I a lot of times I'll play a game out and just try to enjoy myself against someone. But if I see like you know the Shin Hair starter deck, I I'm immediately a little bit disappointed because number one I don't feel like the person I'm playing is going to have a good experience, and two if I quit then he's ex he's especially not having a good experience because he's yeah. you know he doesn't even get that chance to play. Right. So yeah, it's tough. It would be nice um, well, to have separate queues. Like in other online digital games, there's definitely places where there's like a new player area, and you can't stop right. people from going in there with their like really awesome decks. But it is very yeah. highly discouraged. Um, right. So it, it would be it's nice hard to see that. As always, just be a gracious opponent. Be be nice. Yeah. Or maybe have some sort of like system where like it grades the cards in your deck, and mm -hmm. it's like you can only go into this area if you basically are running a deck with like this many rares like you know limit the rares or something right right yeah and the nice thing about it is that wouldn't necessarily be incredibly accurate but it would be accurate enough where that you're not going to play someone who just is like the starter yeah or starter decks only where it just locks in it's like if you don't if you aren't playing the starter deck you can't play type yeah of it's thing. like if I you're think, if you're playing with 70 percent Right, if you're playing with 70 to 80% of a starter deck, then you, you should maybe be queued in with those people. Yeah, I think, yeah. So, uh, next thing, goal setting. Um, yeah, this kind of goes along with making sure you have a focus, but goal setting is something I have to do as, like, um, learning game development and stuff like that. If I don't set goals, then I don't press myself hard enough to get things done. I'm a big procrastinator, personally, and I know a lot of other people are out there as well. Um, so you have to set attainable goals every week. So, it, like, I'm going to do this many games this week, and I want to get at least like 60% win rate. Or I want to I want to practice against Gore Feast this week and make sure that I know exactly what I'm going to side in this week. Um, maybe for the tournament tomorrow, like my personal goal is go at least five and three. Like that's a realistic goal. And if I do better than that, then that's great. If I do less than that, then maybe I need to go back to the drawing board and say, what happened? Um, reassess, like either I had bad draws or I made bad misplays, which did happen. I actually went back through video footage a couple of tournaments ago and I made a couple of very key one mistake misplays, which cost me games. And, um, and then, uh, or maybe, you know, it just wasn't my day type of thing. Um, 
but goal setting very very important to do because otherwise you're just going to kind of like go into things and not really uh, have any goal in mind. It's like my goal is to win. It's too ambiguous. You need to like set things up um, when you're in a when you're in a group. Usually, what we'll do to save time is it's kind of like when the game gets to a certain level of like chances are that someone's not going to be able to come back. There's no reason to play it out because that just wastes everybody's time. Um, right. It's better to just simply say, all right, let's go to game two and see what it looks like after siding, or let's try game one again and see, let's try a couple of game ones and see how the different hands play out, you know? Right, right. Um, very, very much more important. Yeah, I also like goal setting in, in this scenario because if you go into this mindset of like you build a new deck and you're not putting it up against things that are particularly good, I don't think you're doing a good service to your deck. You don't, you're not doing something. So if you have a goal of, I want to jump into, let's say, I don't know, a seal, or let's jump into a constructed tournament. I want to finish at least like top two. Well, you're, you're, the chances are you're going to face some pretty decent decks. Like setting yourself up to have that kind of success and putting yourself through the ringer a little bit kind of builds up that endurance for going into a tournament. Um, and and that, it's helpful. I, I like to jump in and see if I can find, just ask around the queue and be like, hey, is there anybody who has a pretty good deck or someone that wants to test for tomorrow? Stuff yeah, like that. I'll see if I can pull someone up. One. Right, yeah. because these people have the same mindset I do. They have the same goals. They they want to bring. They want to put this deck through something a little bit more challenging. So, that's always good to have. Okay, I turned my mic up a little bit, so hopefully that'll be better. Thanks for telling me that, uh, Dark Moon. I really appreciate that. Do stick around, everybody, because we got a lot of singles to give out tonight. Um, so everybody sick. should hopefully go de go home with something nice. Yeah, today. sick, sick giveaways. Sick giveaways. This is again the going away from this location. The last time you will see this backdrop in this particular formation will be tonight mm -hmm. on tonight's show as far as shows go. I'll probably still do some streaming. I'll be streaming tomorrow. Um, but yep. as far as shows go, this is the last time you'll see this um, mm -hmm. because uh, I will not be doing the show until I am fully moved in on my no new location. Yeah, I'm excited. I get to we'll check know. this out. I know. For a while. And then in celebration tonight you're gonna make it rain singles that's right buddy some some nice <laughs> rares and legendaries all kinds right. of nice stuff so um next thing practice practice Practice. now we all have seen the video or a lot of us have seen the video basketball fans have seen the Allen Iverson video where he complains about them telling him he needs to go to practice to practice with everybody else and the thing is okay Maybe you're the best player on your team. Maybe you're the Allen Iverson of your team and you are the best person or maybe the Zubrin of your team or whoever. It's still there's still things that you can pick up from other people by playing against them. And on top of that, as a team, be part of being a good team and a good team member is helping other people out. So if you're on a team, you're kind of obligated to do that. Um, you know, maybe you're the best player on your team, you're still you should still be helping people out because if you're not, then why are you on the team? Like, if you're really that good, why do you need a team? Um, that's just my whole, like, take on it. You have to practice. You need to set practice dates and then stick to them. And don't make them crazy. Like, when I used to run a guild a long time ago, the way I did my raids is I said, all right, we're going to meet at such and such time. We have three hours. And once that three hours is up, we are done. I don't care how close we are to defeating a boss. I don't care like how many times we've smacked up against the wall. We are done at three hours. And the reason why is to prevent burnout. Um, right. Having specific time set so that way people can schedule their lives around it, especially people with you know things to do like homework or college work or kids or wives and this and that. Very, very, very important to uh, schedule things. Otherwise, you know, you hear about all these guilds, like for instance in MMOs, where it's that they just go for like 12 hours and then burn them out, and they don't know why it is that you know they're losing players here and there, and then all of a sudden the whole guild shuts down because the guild master just has had enough of it. You don't want to do that to your players, so set practice times and stick to them. That's my suggestion there. So, any any add-ons there, throw-ons there? No, I one of the things I liked was I've been in some guilds and some groups where the guy who's organizing it did a little bunch of delegating. I think putting a little bit more into the hands of the players that you're relying on says a lot about you as, you know, a leader. And leadership is actually leadership in organization is hard. It's not an easy skill set to learn. So, you know, be be, you know, trusting of all your other players, be positive and work things out to your best. Um the final thing on this list is 
come into practice like with a deck that you really really want to win everybody knows that I play either basically control some sort of blue uh, diamond uh, I'm sorry sapphire blood control or most of the time I'm running these type of ramp decks lately um, I, I really dislike playing blood diamond control I really dislike playing um, uh, the gore feast gore storm decks even though I know that those are some really good decks um, I just dislike playing them. They aren't very enjoyable for me to play, and I don't really want them to win. I want to beat them um, when I come into practice. That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing for someone else to come into practice and say, I really love this deck, and I'm going to play it, and I'm going to try to beat all of the other decks that are out there um, and get the proper siding and the proper reserves set up. It's really good to have people that want the deck to win, because if you get into that situation and you say, really, I really need to test against somebody that has Gorefees, and I have Gorefees and I test against you, I don't really want it to win to begin with. So right. why would you want to play against me playing Gorefees, even though I'm going to pilot it to the best of my ability? Deep down, somewhere in my subconscious, I'm saying to myself, I really dislike this deck. And yeah. um, I'm going to play it as well as I can to try to help my teammate out. But at, at the core of me, I just don't like it. So it's just one of those things. I think they talked about it. They touched on it on the, uh, the Five Shards podcast a little bit where they said uh, something along the lines of... Um, I forgot what it was now. But basically, it's, it's very, very similar. It's basically, you know, you could be uh, a pretty competent player, but you're playing a certain deck and you don't really understand the deck. And so your opponents could say, oh, I played against that deck and I'm ready for it. Well, then they get into a tournament and they play with somebody that really actually wants to win with that deck. And they're like, whoa, they get blown out by it. And they're like, what just happened? They were doing things I didn't know that that deck could do. Um, so that's a big difference between the players. You know, when you play against me and I'm playing this I Have Creation deck tomorrow, I really want it to win. Um, kind of a big deal. Right, right. Yeah, it, I, again, it comes back to some of the other points you made and other topics too about getting that time in, get that practice, use it. You know, practice makes perfect. Nobody, people who are like gifted artisans at all types of things, a lot of them are, most of them are that way because of hard work. Uh, you know, some of the best sports players in the world, you know, natural talent only takes you so far. You have to put in that hard work and practice, and this is the same kind of deal. I mean, you have to be in the right mindset. So if you want to be good and you want to be good with the deck, invest time in it, and I think you'll see those, you'll yeah. see a lot of great strides. Yeah, you want to invest yourself in the deck, but at the same time, you need to be able to distance yourself from the deck so that way when it doesn't perform, you can't feel, you can't take it personally. And right, right. Like, I've seen people in real life take full decks of cards that were worth four or five hundred dollars and throw them on the ground and mm. act like children um right unacceptable <laughs> that's yeah, ridiculous yeah. okay i understand you know it's just a game you invest yourself in it but at the same time and you could feel emotional about it and you've seen me i get emotional about it a little bit um when i lose i don't feel good about it it doesn't feel good to lose but at the same time you need to be able to distance yourself from it and say you know what happened here was it a bad draw? Did I make right. misplays? Or was it just a bad matchup? What actually happened here? You know, The best tip I can probably give people is if you watch how I play, don't play like that and you'll be good. <laughs> that is the there number one tip. There you go. Number don't one tip play like night. Golden Saucer Guy. Tip of the night. Oh, I don't even have my um, cool like thing up. There we go. There, it's there. See? And we can see all the comments. Yay. All right. <laughs> we have comments. For some reason, I had it turned off. I'm not sure why. Right. Whew. All right. So we've looked at Kai Mime's deck for like the last 20 minutes. You guys have memorized it by now, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And we will look at some of the changes that I've made to the deck. Um, the reserves, I'm not fully set on right now, so don't quote me on that. But we're going to see very similar things and then some changes. So first things first, four shards of fate. I went ahead and reduced the wild shards from 11 down to nine, and then the ruby shards down to seven. Everybody knows that when I play a deck, I want consistency. And one of the things I noticed was a huge problem for me personally was I'm running triple threshold wrath with Colossus, which should be pretty easy to get to when I'm at nine and I have all this fixing I'm playing. But the bigger problem was triple threshold eye of creation. This, this card needs to be cast for 5 or 6, and that means I need to have that triple threshold in play, which isn't too bad to get to, but on top of all of that, I've got triple threshold Zakir in this deck. 
Um, so I have to get double, triple threshold in play, and that's kind of a lot to ask, and I found out that a lot of times, if I, in my opening hand, if I didn't have a ruby shard and a wild shard in my opening hand, at least one of each, um, I'm in really bad, uh, a really bad situation. Um, not as much with the ruby shard, but more so with the wild shard. Um, so in order to fix that, I went ahead and just threw the, the shards of fate in here. It's not that bad for me because most of the time in the early turns, I can afford to um, play those shards where I'm not able to play something immediately. Um, there are a lot of turn two cards in this deck, but I felt like the Shards of Fate just made the game, the deck so much more consistent for me that I couldn't do without it. Yeah, I took a tough loss to have Hex Havoc over the last tournament because I, I drew nothing but uh, Sapphire Shards. I was stuck in it. I couldn't get the wild moving, and when I did, it was too late. So... Yeah, I mean, Shards of Fate, even, there's going to be times you're playing that deck, or playing any deck, and you, you're you not getting that color you're looking for. And when you draw that Shards of Fate, you are going to be the happiest person in the world that you right. got when that. you need the fixing. You yeah, right. I mean, in your opening hand, you're like, oh, I just need a Ruby Shard. Oh, Shards of Fate. All right, good enough. I don't right. get a charge off of it, but it'll do. You right, know? and a lot of times, too, you're looking at, let's say, for instance, you're running, you have three Wild out, and you're really looking for that Ruby. Well, you already have three Wild sitting there at the bot. You've got three ability for, you know, to cast them at the cost of three. You immediately drop that Shards of Fate, you grab that Ruby. Now you have that one Ruby threshold, and you're still sitting on three to work with. So chances are there's something that can happen, there's something you can do. Yeah, it's going to slow you down if you want an early smooth game, but a lot of times being able to play your whole hand is a lot better than having that early strong play. Yeah. Uh, next big thing is I actually remove, reduced the shard count from 25 down to 24 and added Puck the Dreamer for an extra shard. And here's the reason why. Um, you could have a possibility of a very explosive hand. Now he's kind of he's unique, which makes him kind of clunky with Eye of Creation. Our other unique troop in here is Zakir, but Zakir is so crazy good that having two of them in the deck is okay if I double Eye of Creation them and one of them stays in play and the other one goes into my uh, graveyard. It's not that bad, but with Puck, I felt like that would have been that would have felt pretty bad. Um, so, anyways, you could potentially have a Howling Brave in turn one, turn two, you could have Puck the Dreamer and Chlorophilia, and play both of them. You play your Chlorophilia first, which gives you two resources um, left over, and then you play your your Puck the Dreamer. So now, on the following turn, you could have between six and eight resources if you have one of your big drops and if you look at the deck we've got uh three plus four plus four plus three so that would be eight I'm doing public math right now 14 so we have 14 shots at having uh activations for puck the dreamer where he can um give us some resources so not that bad worth a one drop i slot he also blocks some of the early stuff in some of the more popular things like gore feast um, I'm really not sure what this deck does against Gorefeast. I'm guessing it just it, it basically loses or it plays an Eye of Creation and hopefully gets like a game locking card and play like um, Eternal Guardian or even Eternal Guardian doesn't really game lock you. Um, Wrathwood Colossus. Maybe it gets a Wrathwood Colossus in play or something. Um, yeah, with so many less players playing Gorf these Gorfies decks, and I'm not saying that that is like the deck to beat right now, but with more players branching out and trying new things, you know, we don't we don't know how this is going to face off against Gorfies necessarily. Right. I mean, I'm or sure how that many, how many times you're going to face it, but I would still want to be ready, right. which, which is in the reserves, and we'll talk about that. Um, let's see. Next big change is Mancubus. Everybody knows, and I, I keep saying that, everybody knows that I am a big fan of mancubus Filk ape combo. It's just so much fun. I have to put it in here. And so what I sacrificed for that was I gave up one of my crazed Squirrel Titans. And Squirrel Titan is really good in this deck. However, I felt like a lot of times it would sit in my hand and I needed that sixth resource and I couldn't play it, uh, which was really super awkward. And on top of that, like, there are there are some situations where it just basically trades with things, which isn't the greatest. Um, it just felt like a little bit underwhelming for a six drop. Although it, hopefully most of the time you're going to remove something with it and have a four four body in play, which your opponent will not want to bounce at all, uh, because then you get to kill something else the next turn. But hopefully, right. if you have seven resources, then yeah, uh, it was it was I played someone earlier in the event the day that played one and put it out and all my troops had spell shield and you know how that ends 
Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so sometimes you maybe you won't even have a target, because like, your right. opponent's playing uh, Soul Marble or something, which would be true of Mancubus as well. But Mancubus does a similar thing. Mancubus is a card that you want to cast for six, because you want to be able to activate it the turn it comes into play. Now, it's basic action speed, which is a little bit slow, but I can steal my opponent's stuff, and in the Gore Feast matchup, I love Mancubus because I can steal, um, I can steal uh, basically everything in their deck with it except for except for the spy and uh what's his name uh the four four but i mean chances of that guy coming up are somewhat you know uh low what's his name mm -hmm. i think uh, it's off my head either uh, the four four of dwarf i forget what his name is but um yeah steals everything in their deck steals me blockers and then when i have phil cape in play i can steal stuff every turn probably one of the silliest plays i've had is i played uh, a you know a different version of this deck which ran more mancubus versus blood diamond control and he had a vampire king in play so he vampire kings i have a mancubus in hand and an arbarian root father and i have a phil cape in play yeah i have a phil cape in play and six resources he attacks he happens to hit arborian root father which turns the arborian root father into a 2-2 two -two, um turns it into a or actually i didn't have Phil Cape in play, but anyways, it turned the Root Father into a 2-2, two -two, uh, what is it called, uh, vampire, vampire on his turn, yeah. flying vampire on his on his turn, so then I'm like, I'll just take it back, thanks, so I play Mancubus, steal it back, and then on the following turn, I play a Phil Cape, turning it back into Arborian Root Father, and he's like, where did that Root Father come from? I was like, you stole it from me, and then I stole it back, <laughs> it was... <laughs> I mean, chances of that happening are pretty low, but it was right, still yeah, pretty it was still fun. Neat. That was pretty good. That was just, you know, a nice pickup game. Stuff like that doesn't happen to me. I'm only lucky when I do pickup games. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I only win with luck. That's the only way I win. Just, just right. you know, it's the only way I win. No skill, just luck. Um, but that, that's pretty much the deck. It's pretty much the same deck. I just made a couple of tweaks for my personal preferences, and, and sometimes that's, you know, good, and sometimes it's not so good. So I guess we'll find out tomorrow uh, if my tweaks pay off or if they don't. Um, that's that's pretty much that. We'll go to the reserves real quick and talk about that before we go to the deck doctor here. We're cutting into our deck doctor time. Yeah, it's all good. So a must here is Heat Wave. Uh, definitely a must here. The Eternal Guardians versus the Blood Diamond Control matchup. The Phil Cape. I'm not so sure about after, you know, I've, I've gone up to four and then I was like, ah, oh, it just felt like it was too much. And so I've, I'm starting to dial it back a bit. Gobble Glade Witch is definitely a must versus the uh, so many soul marbles that are out there. That's that's definitely coming in against that uh, Blood Diamond control matchup. This Thorn Tongue Snapdragon, I'm not sure if this is supposed to come in against um, against the, uh, the Gore Feast or not because... It kind of plays slow. I need four. I guess it has Sky Guard no matter... No, it doesn't even have Sky Guard and Lethal unless I have four Wild Threshold. I feel like it's just going to get bounced and someone's going to... And then they'll be like Gore Feast and you're, you're dead anyways. Right, right. So I don't... I'm not sure that I like it in here. I actually like Burn um, a little bit more because it's a little bit more proactive. It's, it's You know, it can get countered, I guess, uh, and Gore Feast is running two uh, counters for it, but... I just like to for them to be like Gorefeast, and I'm like burn in response, and then they're like, okay, I guess I get to deal nine damage with my right. Poka Power with Gorefeast, and then it dies, and I I don't get to deal the other you know damage that I need to to kill you this turn, and now I'm kind of in a you know in a a little bit on the back foot. I, I'd rather right. have that um, than I think Thorn Tongue Snapdragon. Personally. Yeah, I don't know if I like Thorn Tongue too much. But I guess a lot it's, of times it's, it's another Blood Diamond Control card because it kills Angel, right? And that's right, kind of right. slow. Maybe if they don't turn two Angel, you. Yeah, the thing I guess if I wanted to play Devil's Advocate, the things I like about it is you're you're wild. You have a lot of opportunity to pull wild in that deck. So getting those wild out the wild threshold might not be as hard as most people would expect. Also, with your ability to ramp and pull cards off the top of your deck, you're also gonna you know you have a good potential to get that going. If that comes out and it's, it does have lethal and sky guard, I mean, well, yeah, that, it's, that's it's in a lot good. of ways. That's pretty as much long the as it end doesn't there. Get bounced, you're good. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I can see a good, I would like to test it to see because I can't say for sure it's right hard. now that it is good or bad. Yeah. 
I mean, like right now, what I'm looking at as far as the Gorefeast matchup is like, because that's what everyone talks about. Uh, Cluckadon, Heat Wave definitely come in, and the rest of this stuff, I'm like, I don't know. I maybe a maybe a Squirrel Titan, maybe a Phil Cape. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So, and I have not like about, against it because I don't have. I a don't team. really like Squirrel Titan against that matchup. Again, you do or it's don't. One of those I don't. You uh, it seems no, I, I I don't because I think there's other cards I would rather have than it. Like it's a it, horrible a bounce good... target for them, you know? right? And exactly. That's most of their removal is bounce. Yeah, and they're not going to burn it because they're not going to they're not going to dedicate not, a double yeah, burn. Yeah, they have to double burn it. it. Right. So I can see a sense that it would be good, but again, this is one of those times where there's other things. There. There's other things I'd like to be looking for in order to go against your Gorfies. I like succulent Cluckadon for the life gain you have. Yep. It you know, doesn't you... kill anything though, because it only kills things that right. cost one. I mean, this but... the, the cost one. I guess is really good against the the mono ruby gore feast, but um, yeah, right. I, I like mean, the, the main four decks life, that we're, we're seeing right now are gore feast and still blood diamond control. Like those are the main decks, and there's some blood sapphire that kind of eats in there a little bit here and there, um, and then we've got the new. Uh, ruby diamond, which is basically the same as blood diamond control, except it just goes into ruby, so it has quick action speed removal. Um, yeah, we saw some wild the same sapphire. Same things you're doing against that, or what you're going to do. Uh, the same things you do against blood diamond is what you're pretty much going to do against um, blood ru or ruby. You know, it's, and you have a lot of toughness for them to punch through. So right, right, right. I don't know that it's. I think blood diamond is a worse matchup for you, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, like we we saw some interesting decks, and I think that might be this might be best suited for, you know, that variety of things we're gonna that are gonna be coming out. I don't know what we're gonna see tomorrow. I couldn't even begin to guess. But the last event we were in, there was a lot of variety, there was a lot of new things, and that was fun. And this deck might do better against those kind of things. It has a little kind, a little bit of a of from different areas. It's got the ability to like take troops and dominate in stats and play fast and early. So it's got opportunities to do well against a variety of things. We just don't know what it does against score feasts because I haven't yeah. myself personally seen it. It's so there's so much hatred. No one wants to play it in the proving grounds. I know. Oh wow. So moving on to the deck doctor of tonight and I, I again I'll just po apologize to whoever it was that submitted the last deck doctor that I didn't put on a list and I should have and I yeah. Anyways I was listening to the Threshold, or the, I'm sorry, the um, Five Shards podcast this week, and they talked about this combo. So basically, we've got Talisman of Vite Vite. Um, right. Basically, says one shot for five, you can gain three charges, and when you gain a charge power, you gain one health for each charge spent. Okay. And then you have Doppel Gadget. And so, what the thing is, Doppel Gadget lets you copy stuff every turn for four or less. It used to copy any artifact, but then they said, oh, that's too much. Um, so they, they nerfed it. You know, this is way pre-alpha. Um, so right, you guys right. have probably, if you're new to the game, you've never seen it in any other form. Right, um, right. But so we can, what you can do is copy the talisman and then use its one-shot ability on Doppel Gadget. And then the next turn, you copy it again, which means you make a fresh copy of right. Vite. And you can use its one shot again. So that means every turn for five resources at quick action speed during, you know, like in your opponent's end step, you can gain three charges, which is pretty powerful because that means that you could probably use somebody your champion power every other turn or with some champions right. every turn. So we just right. need to figure out what this is going to go into. Um, well, I mean, there's the the answers that are the easy ones where you pick things like Poka. Where you know you can get that extra attacker every other round, every other turn, or in some maybe you've built up a few shards from playing your, or you've played your different shards, so you you have a couple banked in there anyway. So you're playing the poker power every turn. Uh, there's some more ridiculous ones where you're using the one where you can bounce all the troops back to their hands, and maybe get that off on turn I don't know five or something. You can go with Zerid and just you know like minus one minus one things all the time. You could right right. Go with uh, Polonus and create Mammoth Squirrel Titans, maybe, but this one costs eight, so I'm right. not really a uh, big things, fan of that one. I, I mean, this might feels like, like a charge heavy deck, you know? Right, right. I mean, I think the ones you don't use are the ones that only cost two because you're producing them faster than you're able to use them. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Uh, um, things I playing, like. If you're playing with other charge cards on top of that, charge cards. Mm -hmm. Um, you kind of, yeah, you want to be able to use all that, those, those charges. So I think maybe our focus should be something in the higher cost range that doesn't seem playable Probably as often. Probably four to five, I'd say. Right. Um, like, but Nushi only costs three. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. and Bertram only costs three. So you could Ooh, create... here we go. Farney. Look at that. Yeah, Farney removal, seems pretty pretty good. Removal, I mean, he's got we're that playing removal. high artifact costs. Yeah. yeah I like I it. I kinda dig that. Yeah, um let's do it's, the, it, I, yeah, it seems pretty good. I mean Yeah, Farney's removal, it bounces you're playing off something we already have in the deck. Yeah, that um, seems pretty good. So we're already in Ruby, so we're definitely playing Ruby. I don't know if we need to go into another I did play against a mono Ruby Farney deck the other day and um it it hurt my feelings because I didn't draw removal again when I was playing control versus it, but you know. That was a horrible weekend for me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it was, it was. The funny thing is, like, it was it was a little rough on you, and I just kind of, I, I guess I won't lie. Like, I picked a deck that I had played a bunch in practice, and like, eh, I'll try this one out, and did just really well. I was so happy to see this junky deck I put together do really better well. than expected. Yeah, yeah. Um. So some of the things, I mean, we definitely want to play a decent amount of artifacts in this deck. We also want to play some charge cards in here. So probably right off the bat, we can probably go ahead and uh, play. Okay. Well, uh, what's it first things Crackling first, uh, I want to right off the bat say we need to put that guy in his steals charge powers. Because if we're going to play charge deck, we might as well have some fun with some charge He's power. He's broken, but yeah, let's, like he isn't right. working properly. Oh, he isn't? All right, but, that's fine. But, but, he, but that is a good idea. I like that guy anyway. So it's, I think he costs six. I forget what his name is, yeah. though. He's an artifact. He makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're going to be, we're having yeah, charge Eternal power Drifter fun. is not working properly, necessarily. Oh, that sucks. But we'll throw him in there anyways. All right. If he doesn't fit the deck type when we're done, we'll yank him out. Yeah, we can. Yeah, this is the preliminary stages. We, You know how we do things. Right, we're going to be at 100 cards in two minutes. Yeah. Uh, we should probably go ahead and throw the shards in here, though. Ruby. Now I do think about I did think about heavily go, going into um into what is it called uh, sapphire because sapphire has a lot of good charge type things like storm cloud that type of stuff I was actually thinking about it after I lost so horribly with my control deck I was like man I probably should have played storm cloud because it gives you a ton of blockers and card draw oh, reactor man, bot yeah. seems like a pretty good one that's that's another one that beat my face in last weekend yep. or last time we played a major tournament rather. Yeah, uh, Reactor yeah. Bot has the potential to be a huge bomb. For one. Okay, we also have Pulse Reactor's okay, but it's probably not necessary for this. I have played it before. I'm playing right. it in Scrap Tech Brawler for now, but it probably won't make the final cut. But that's just basically to get us to like Eternal Drifter. But that, that probably actually doesn't really work out. Um, Scrap Tech Brawler is 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 a very popular card right now, though. For sure. It's another dwarf. We could actually put plans in here. Um, but I don't know if there's any plans that really fit the deck. Um, we saw that last weekend there was the the tunneling guy was playing uh, what's it called uh, that tunneling ten ten or whatever it is. This don't mind thing, me, the, I'm the like Mega Hulk. He was playing that. Um, but I think I would want to play more things that like excavate quickly. Right, right. For each dwarf and or robot. Yeah, we aren't really playing a lot of robots just yet. No, I'm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm seeing it. It is Crush. I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's neat. The other thing about... The only only other issue is, like, Talisman and... Uh, Talisman and Doppelgadget um, don't actually, like, do anything by themselves uh, to the board state unless you have your Farney charge power up. Right. Um, so that could be an issue for the deck. Um, the other thing is maybe we want to have a certain amount of artifacts for Doppelgadget to actually copy, so we need some more four lesses. We've got the Reactor Bots, so Doppelgadget could become another Reactor Bot, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what are we looking at for decent four or less cost ones? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the turret wall, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, don't be like me and run into a tournament with a bunch of turreted walls. You did pretty well with all those turrets. Yeah, I, yeah, I had a game where my one turret wall is making three rhinos a turn. Secret Lab is a maybe here. I right. mean, it does help you like push through the deck if you're not. I mean, we so far we aren't really drawing anything, drawing any cards. Actually, what might be cool in here is uh, the one that puts an artifact into play. Uh, maybe not. The guy that what's his name puts it puts an artifact into play every turn. Uh, oh, you know, maybe that's why we should go into Sapphire just for that guy. Right, right. Just for, um, I mean, because like I, if you're playing dwarves nowadays, you pretty much have to play that guy. 
I need to pick up four copies of that Rune Forge guy. The one that when he comes into play, you can sack two artifacts and put one into play from your uh, discard pile. Whatever. No, not Saboteur. Where are you? Where are you? I forget what his name is. Reese. That's right, Reese. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. R R R. Oh, maybe I should just type it in. I should probably just type it in. <laughs> I'm probably like, oh, there he is. Yeah, this guy. I think he's an e automatic two of now. Like he's just no doubt, so good. Yeah. So yeah. Good. The uh, the previous Hextax event, I lost to him because I just could not keep up. Yeah, you can't. Like if he hits the table and sticks to the table, he's a lot like Zakir. He's very this similar kept, to Zakir. Yeah, I kept getting those T Rex things, and he like just luck. He had like three of them by the time the game was over. I just couldn't handle it. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous luck. But again, better to be lucky. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, Terabot could be interesting in here, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, we do need a decent amount of artifacts, so that's probably more or less what we should be looking at: is more artifacts mm -hmm. than anything else. Can't play Jank Bot. We could play an Infiltrator. We could play Indec Inductocopter Bot. I've seen a lot of people have trying to get this to go. My biggest problem with Inductocopter Bot is it's very weak body. Um, right, right. You know, we know the blood three. control is a big deal, so that can easily kill him um, with Zerid alone. Um, but it is an artifact, and you know, murder doesn't deal with it. Uh, you know, like it probably flies right past most of the stuff in my deck that I'm running tomorrow. You gain a charge. It does play on turn three. It does charge up those other guys. I mean, for now, I guess we can throw them in there and see if we want to keep them or not. Yeah. It's another thing we can copy with our, our, our power, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. So it does fit the bill there. Right. I'm, I'm, the only thing is I, I'm having issues finding times where I'd be like really excited to have drawn one off the top of my deck. Like, oh, sweet, I got an inductocopter. I can't wait to... Yeah, I can't wait to gain a charge right. with it. Could play Gearsmith in here. You know, it's just like free card draw and another dwarf. Could play the Forge in here. Let's see. Is it? It's it's. We have to discard a dwarf artifact or dwarf yeah we could play forge in here sure we could play a two of forge or maybe mm -hmm. even a four of forge what's this going for these days uh, i'm not even sure three four dollars yeah it's kind of a little bit pricey i think this is a card that you really need to try out to figure out where you want it to be at but could accelerate you which is nice unfortunately right. we can't choose to play fisher smith i won't choose i won't put this in a deck until it's fixed um that's just going to have to be the, the nature of the beast. But it wouldn't be a yeah. card, at least in the reserves. I mean, if we're really trying to help someone out and building some really decent deck and you can't even use it in any of the tournaments right now, there's no point in exactly. it. Exactly. Um, I and mean, a lot of this is theory craft right now, anyways. Uh, Electroid seems like an amazing card for this deck. Let's see. What else? Uh, Shrine could go in your reserves pretty easily. Mm -hmm. That seems like a great card for this deck. Right. Although you really would never copy it. I'm not sure that I would play Fist in here, but we'll just preliminarily like throw two of them in, I guess. Doesn't do anything with charges. But you could copy it, and then it's you know you have even more of Drew's Unrelenting Fist. The problem is you have to pay three for each one of them. That's mm -hmm. the only issue. You use your resources for this every turn. Um, right, right. If we had a deck that was building off resources, you know, maybe. But I like... Uh, Drew's Colossal Walker. The problem is that it costs five, so we can't copy it with Double Gadget. So I did play a guy who had Drew's and that one wild card that refilled your resources. The what's the name of the sun? Uh, and that was neat, but in the end, Unrelenting Fist just isn't that great. Yeah. Um, so now that we're in Sapphire, we can actually play Cloud. So that's kind of fun. Um, yeah. I'm going to stay away from, even though you could easily play Buccaneer in here, I'm just going to go ahead and just stay away from playing Buccaneer because it's, it's, it's still good. I wouldn't fault anyone for playing it in here. Um, it does tempo things. It doesn't kill things. I guess that's one thing you could say about it uh, as far as it not fitting into the, the, the general theme of the deck and what we're trying to do here. I'm not sure that I'm seeing Oh, Chaos Key. Yeah, that's an easy one. I can put those in there. Right, right. Charge Hulks, uh, maybe, and then Charge Bot also could work in here. 
we are playing a charge chargey kind of a deck. Another thing in the reserves we can run like counter magic and uh, verdict for those sweep decks. I'm not sure how many you would necessarily need. You probably wouldn't need a ton of them. Right, right. But it's nice to have that option open. Maybe mm. two verdict and th four counters or three counters, something like that. Uh, where's the eight? Yeah, right, so Reactor Bot and top. Arena Regular, just as mentioned Correct. by Armies of Mordor. I mean, if you're going to be gaining three charges, that's three damage right there, and that's a that's plus what? So plus six, plus six. So reactor bot. I mean, if it just kind of seems like we're we're really all in on this, lots of charges thing. Recent storm cloud dies to zero. Arena regular and storm cloud. Yeah, I mean the yeah sure the 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 charge bot definitely dies to. Uh, to Zerid as well. That's the only other issue. But hopefully you would have gotten like the chart the whole reason why you play charge bot is go turn two charge bot, turn three swing for like five or seven. Um, right. it's it's very possible because you can drop your shard and then play like a crackling bolt or crackling wit or something or maybe a charge bot or something. And you can definitely do that much um, in that turn or maybe do like like if you had a if you had a hand where it was if it was uh two charge bots a like three sh no you only need two shards so two charge bots three shards i guess we have to fix the shards and uh the, the reactor bot you could turn to a reactor bot and then drop both of your charge bots mm -hmm. plus a shard or oh, actually you would need a third shard um yeah. and then so swing for nine and then hope that your reactor bot didn't get removed and then we'll add gore feast <laughs> and then gore feast because right. because it just goes in everything right because now yeah, we have I mean, if, we have this storm say, cloud yeah let's say you have reactor bot and you make him uh i don't know a 9 9 because of that activating that ability once but you're going to get any three charges off it so it right there it's a plus 6 plus 6 you're a 7 7 maybe a 9 9 if you have some other way right you you gore feast i mean you're swinging in 10 9 11 9 have, they have to block add a little trample into that and it might be game over Okay. I'm not adding like ten cards to make this work. <laughs> four minutes. Okay, ninety-four cards in four minutes. Or, That's yeah, we got about four our usual. To fix the deck. Not unusual for what we have to do on this show. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this in blinding speed. So scrap type brawler is an easy one. We'll just pull that out right away. Um, and then that means I get rid of Eternal Drifter here because that's just not happening for me. Uh, Electroid can stay for now. Gearsmiths can stay. And Ductocopter Bob doesn't really. Yeah, like we were saying, it just dies to zero, so we don't really like it. Crackling Bolt can stay for now. Chaos Key, we can move to the reserves. Like two of them, I guess, for now. Right. Armies of Mortar made an excellent point. My crazy plan does require nine resources. I'm not saying it's a good one, but yeah, I just want to play every card in the game in one turn. I only want to play, play all, all the masking. cards. All the right. cards. Right. That's no big deal. Let's see. Where are we at? Let's four would be like 19 so we're probably going to be heavy in rubies so it'll be something like a let's go with a 10 9 for now i'll fix the <laughs> shards later i promise we will not probably do the shard thing tonight but we've got 23 resources in here uh we're fixing our curve as we go four drops look right. pretty bad because we've got all of the charge hulks so we'll take that down to like <laughs> two for now um and we've got some other forge oh we've got talisman huh <laughs> Yeah. And that's the whole Armies point of, of the Mortar, deck. I'm with you. Every time we build a just deck play jank on, bot then. on deck building, yeah, we just let's add 30 more cards. Just make a jank bot. Yeah, it's just <laughs> every time. Uh, Storm Cloud works really well with that. Reese is fine because he's a he's a tunneler. Gearsmith is okay, but doesn't really. Yeah, uh, we could probably you take our Gearsmiths down to like maybe one. Oh, I just removed so them. that's fine. The talisman ability. Isn't basic. So on your turn, they swing in. You activate the talisman that's sitting off your your guy, and you block with a seven seven. So I guess the cool thing about Forge is you could actually copy Forge and then cop with Doppel Gadget. That's actually pretty cool. Um, actually, let's. Yeah, I'm yeah. I think sure there might be some hidden combos in here. Maybe that we don't even know about. Uh, right. Let's see. Is he? I, I got rid of him. I need to put him back in here. Where are you? You cost one. 
There he is. Let's put him back in. Just like maybe one or two Gearsmiths for now. We were at 69 cards on episode 59. Ah. Uh, Crackling Wit, we can pull that for now. I'm not sure if you wanted that anyways. Crackling Vortex, I guess we can take... Mm -hmm. We have a lot of single thresholds, so we should be okay with playing the place of Crackling Vortex. We're very heavy anyways. Let's see, that's four, eight, which means that I need uh, 13, so eight and seven is 15. So let's go down on those. So that's, yep, and again, I'll fix the resources later. So we're actually there. Mm -hmm. Somehow we got there. Yeah, I think you should play mm -hmm. one crushing blow. One crushing blow. Yep, uh, just one. Just all you need. I yeah, because you don't you don't want to draw the card often or anything like that. But there's gonna be a turn where you're swinging well, you with like. You should play a... Gore Master. I think that's a better card. Yeah, probably. Just the one but... Gore Master is better than Crushing Blow. Yeah, but one Crushing Blow, you just all of a sudden surprise. They have a like if I see a Gore Master out. Crushing Blow. If you see a Gore Master out, you go, oh, he could explode into my face with some Trample. If you have a Gore, if you have a Crushing Blow in hand, it's like surprise, you're taking Trample damage today. You could even throw crushing blow on your storm cloud. Ooh. Right. Um, yeah, crushing storm cloud. Luckily, physics is not a part of this. Yeah. That storm cloud just crushed your face. So I'm actually going to. I think I'm going to reduce the doppelgadgets down to three. Just because doppelgadgets is one of those that has to have another artifact in play. So it's a buff to the artifact you already have in play. Right. Um, that's the only issue. That's the only reason why I'm reducing that. But everything else should be mostly okay with the deck. Um, I don't like this right here. We're going from three to four. Um, so I'd like to get this range a little bit better. This this five drop is actually a two drop, so we're okay there. 23 shards should be fine. Most of our stuff is single threshold. I yeah, believe. we're... Right now with Farney, though, we're acting as power to do four damage, which four is Four damage not bad. is the best we can do with Farney, which right. isn't bad, but it's not amazing. No. It does kill Angel, which is very important. Most of the stuff doesn't cost more than four, except for uh, Zakir. Zakir is the only issue there. So uh, I guess maybe play one or two artifacts that are five cost, but then again, that kind of throws everything off. Right, and in the end, I think what we're really doing here is clearing the way for Reactor Bots because with Reactor Bot being two cost and having the ability to clone it, even if you don't, even other things you have, like let's say for instance you have a Charge Bot in hand or Charge yeah. Hulk in hand, yeah. you know, you you copy that Reactor Bot, you play a Crackling Vortex or that Charge Hulk, or whatever, and bam, now you have two decent sized swingers. Or you, so, or you play your Storm Cloud, and then all of a sudden, like you have this army of little like droplets that it created because you've talismaned so many times. Right, so uh, there, there's some nice directions this deck can go that's different ways that might not play out the same way every turn, every game. Yeah, I definitely, I like where this deck is going. This deck needs some work, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. So don't take this as gospel. Like this deck, we're going to show it. I'll put it out on the show. I'll be, build a, a, a reserves for it. It'll probably change a little bit from here to when it gets posted. But we're, we're mostly doing a lot of charge theory crafting here. Um because of the Talisman of Vitae slash Forge um, slash uh, Doppelgadget combo and seeing how we can build around that to, to build a shell that's going to be aggressive while having that combo in there. If the combo goes off, the thing about a combo deck that, that makes it strong is it doesn't need the combo to win. And this is a deck that definitely doesn't need it to win. So No, very, if, very it, if you get to mid-game and you're popping your opponent's creatures for four damage every turn, even if they they have above four damage. I mean, you're you're swinging in, they block, you lose a creature, you kill something they have. So, right. Yeah. So, um, one last thing. Uh, for all the people that participated in the contest last week, I really appreciate it. I had about six votes, which my wife told me was not a lot, apparently. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate all the votes. That's why I will be playing the Eye of Creation deck that I showed you today. There probably won't be any changes in the main deck, in the reserves, I'll probably make some changes here. Um, again, I like burn here. But what I've decided to do is, the way I described the contest last time was if I had five wins tomorrow, people would get some sort of a uh, pack prize or some, uh, basically everybody will get a pack that voted for that deck. So I'm gonna stick with that, but if I play against any of those players tomorrow, um, then I reduce the amount of wins that I need by one. So, those people don't have to feel like they have to throw the game 
to um, to get their one pack of cards, even though they probably wouldn't. But I don't want there to be any uh, any foul play involved, or anyone can say, "Oh, well, you gave away cards, so mm -hmm. so yeah, of course they're gonna throw the game for you." <laughs> so we'll just well, reduce you only it by have one. six so that people game voting. Count. So, so like, if I play against one of them, the, it gets reduced to one. So I have to get four wins tomorrow. If I play against yeah. two of them, I have to get three wins tomorrow to give them packs. Everybody that actually voted last week will get something. I'll probably give them some sort of a rare or a single or I'll ask them what they want. Um, do stick around after the show because that's when we're going to do all the giveaways. Make sure that you're following me here on Twitch. Again, I really appreciate everybody for stopping by. We're going to make this a good episode, a good final episode in this location, this little sanctuary that we've built up, and we will hopefully move to a new sanctuary that will be yeah. much more free uh, a, a zone of child noise. Right, so. and then on top of that, come see me next week. Yes, definitely come see Golden Saucer Guy next week. It will either be hosted on my channel, which I don't think I can do because I'm not a Twitch partner, or it will be on Golden Saucer Guy's channel. Either way, I will inform you through Twitter and through YouTube right, or right. something. I'll maybe put a video out or something. But you will know uh, what's going on, or you will, or Five Shards will probably also have it on their website. We'll put it on there. Uh, exactly where the show will be going next week. If you are a content uh, contributor for Hex, make sure to contact myself or Golden Saucer Guy. Um, he is Golden Saucer Guy uh, at Golden Saucer Guy on Twitter, I believe, right? Right. Yeah. And follow me. Are, I tweet about lots of stuff. And you're also uh, on Twitch. You're also Golden Saucer Guy on Twitch. Yep. yep. So like you you're pretty standard contact, for Hex. And so you can contact him that way. Tonight on Dictum of the Squire, we talked about. Handing over the reins to Golden Saucer Guy, the dress, which everybody's talking about, luck versus skill, and how it is that that's all I run on is just luck, none, no skill, no skill at all. Um, we did uh, the news, talking about the Frost Ring coming next month. Hopefully a lot of the bugs will be worked out with that. The Hextech tournament tomorrow and how it is that we're going to be nice and not play in that tournament and in the stress test tournament at the same time and we we talked about team building and what you need to do to build a successful team even though I don't have one and I don't really have a lot of authority in that specific realm although I did run a guild at one point in time hey, look at that armies of mordor has followed you on twitter thank you oh, armies of mordor that was nice such a and nice guy. then we finished up with a uh, with going over the deck that I'll most likely be playing tomorrow with a couple of tweaks and doing this crazy talisman combo deck, which was pretty cool, um, and it needs a lot of work, honestly. <laughs> uh, we may actually yeah. run this back again next next time I come back in, you know, I don't know, maybe seven weeks. Um, hopefully I'll be set up before then, but you never know. We're definitely going to be down all of next month, as far as I will be down, but Golden Saucer Guy will be running it. So I uh, really appreciate all you guys. Golden Saucer Guy, did you happen to come up with a – you have a sign-off now, right? You have to have a sign-off. Uh, I, I need a, a really good sign-off. So the first thing we're going to be doing for next week is we are going to be allowing players to submit sign-offs. So all you need to do is contact me on Twitter with the sign-off that I should use, and that's at, at Golden Saucer Guy. So if there's a good sign-off you want me to use, let me know. I will put up the people who submit them and will vote on them, and I will use that sign-off. All right, and there was another contest I was going to run while I'm going to be away from the show for this time period, and I forgot what it was, so do keep a lookout for that. I will still be running hex contests and different things so you can win stuff, so do uh, keep, keep an eye on my Twitter and my YouTubes and whatever else. I'll probably put a video out, but I just can't commit to doing the show, so I have to be able to have flexibility right now with the content I'm putting out. So until next time, this is Darren Squire signing off, saying God bless your family. He's trying to rage too much out there. Thank you.